Hey there, welcome to another episode of Life Design Plus, where we are mastering the art of living your authentic life. Now, today's episode is a special one. First, it's the very first episode with the subject matter expert, and this expert happens to be my very good friend, Matt Ziegler. Now, I asked Matt to join me to talk about the subject of creativity. I've written about it before and I've shared this before on the podcast, but I believe creativity is an important part of your pursuit of your authentic life. Creativity can act as a guide towards your passions. It can be a teacher. It brings you pleasure and it allows you to bring our gifts, your gifts and ideas to the world to make the world a better place. You never know what your thoughts, your creativity will mean to somebody else, but if you never share it, we'll never know. So not only is Matt one of the most creative people that I know, as you're going to hear on the podcast, but he's also a student of creativity, which is why he's an expert in my eyes. He studied creatives from all over, whether that be music or writing or art or business and even finance. Matt writes a daily email called The Cultish Creative, which I highly recommend you subscribing to. I get it every morning. And in his professional life, he's a managing director and private wealth advisor at Sunpoint Investments, which is where he gets to bring his creativity to financial planning, which is something that I absolutely love. At his work, he helps clients create, align, and manage their financial plans. Now, while Matt and I are both financial advisors, this conversation has nothing to do with personal finance. This little blurb right here is all you're going to hear about finance. This conversation is fully about finding and expressing your inner creativity. All right, that's enough of an intro from me. Let's get to this great conversation with Matt Ziegler. I've never kicked a, a, a podcast episode off like this, but you, know, you and I were messaging this morning with some extremely rare <laughs> synchronicities going on, but actually not rare with you and I. And you said, hey, I want to start this way. So I'm just going to start with the phrase you sent me, authentically creative. All right. So I had this crazy teacher in college and somehow I'm going to figure out a way to like source this guy down because um, you know those people who have the impact on you mm-hmm. that just... Like, I don't even remember this guy's name, <laughs> but I still think of this all the time because he fostered this word nerd interest in me and I knew you would appreciate this. So the, authentic, the etymology of that word, have you ever looked into it? Like, do you, I'm embarrassed to say no, as much as I love that word and I'm building my future around the authentic life. I've again, I told you before coming into this, I'm nervous to be with you because you are much more thorough and depth and researched than I am. I just find shit that I like and go. So I have not broken down the word authentic. As my soon to be wife will tell you, I'm a Rolodex of mostly useless information <laughs> like this. Okay. I had to look this up too, but I was really curious because authentic and authenticity and all that stuff, it's one of those words that I feel like is, it's like, it's like the broken pen and you have ink on your fingers. You're like, ah, like I see all these influencer and people using it. But then I see somebody like you using, it's like, oh, well, I respect him. So how is he using this? Okay. So this is my way of making peace with something is researching it apparently. All right. So A-U-T and Mm A-U-T-H. Every time you see that um, and authentic as a complete word basically turns to principle and genuine. And I mean principle here in like, in like the financial principle term. So not like I have a five principles I govern my life on, but like the principle of the middle school, Mm -hmm. like you are in charge of the crap that happens in these walls. Mm -hmm. And so authentic means like the genuine principle, the genuine thing in charge. Now what's really cool about AUT and AUTH as a prefix Mm -hmm. is every time we see those, so think like automobile, think it means self. Mm -hmm. So automobile, self driving, like an author is someone who writes their own words. They have principle over the words Mm -hmm. on the page. So that word authentic just alone is sourced in this idea of self, principle, and genuine expression that you are in control of, Mm -hmm. which I kind of freaking love. Mm -hmm. The creative side, so create just means like to make, Mm -hmm. to bring it out in the world. Strangely, you sub the C for a K and you get the word for meat or flesh or protein, which is where like creatine powder and stuff like that comes from. (laughs) Interesting, but that's also part of the fun. So create just means to make. So when we talk about authentic creativity, Mm -hmm. and part of why I wanted to ask you if you knew about this was because this genuine principle self expressing to make something new in the world, I think is the most like beautiful definition or explanation of what you're trying to do with this series. I love the breakdown. I love the word genuine. Like that's one of my favorite words. I don't think I use it as much 
now, but it was one of the words I would use to describe. Like when I would tell people back in the day when I was you know, talking to people about networking and like when you reach out to somebody, like genuinely reach out to somebody because you care. Um, but so I love to hear that genuine is a part of the word authentic. Um, and it is yeah. a buzzword. But the thing is, the reason it's a buzzword is because it's like the value of authenticity is real and it's undeniable. And since it is real and everybody can agree that when you are authentic, it's, it's a better situation for everybody, it's easy to, to jump on that. Because who's going who's gonna to say, no, you're wrong for telling people to be authentic? But when you get like the Instagram influencers and the TikTok people talking about it, like then it does get watered down. And I thought about that. Like I thought about trying to find an alternative word for authentic because of the fact that it is watered down. And I decided I was not going to let other people misusing the word take it away from me because it's the word that I believe I authentically believed I should be using. So I thought about it, but I was like, no, I'm not going to let them win and take that word away from me and me go a different route just because I don't want people to like lump me in there. Over time, the body of work will show you that, okay, this is a different real version of authentic, not some like you know, quick, rich type of scheme or get somebody's attention on, on social media. You get a total pass in my book for using the word because I think you're using it from the right place and actually seeing that breakdown of the definition. And I love that you grabbed onto genuine too, because I really love that word. Like that's the whole thing here. You're redefining it. It's, was it, it's seven up, right? Seven up was the uncola. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like, they were in second place to Coke and Pepsi and whatever forever. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you know what? Stop calling us soda. Mm -hmm. Uncola. <laughs> How's that? Like, we're not that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so you doing authentic creativity or your authentic self, I think, is a way you can be, you know, the uncola of all this other stuff that wants to be another version of soda. I like it. I like it. Well, I consider you one of the best experts I know when it comes to creativity. And, I, you know, I think from the outside, if people follow you, they're going to see that, you know, Cultish Creative is your newsletter. So obviously the creativity, we're going to dive into some of your background that shows people just how creative you are and, and like how you've expressed it in the past. But I also, like I mentioned earlier, like I, I feel like you're very researched in this area. You, you and I have shared conversations and texts about Jay Dilla and you would run circles around me on the subject matter of Jay Dilla and his beast. And to be honest with you, you made me appreciate Jay Dilla more because you forced me to go read the book and learn more about it. Like I was such a n novice about Jay Dilla. Like I knew the Donuts album. That's the name of it, right? Or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Donuts. Yeah, yeah. Donuts knew, was the solo album before he died. So, yeah. so I knew that one. I had no idea that he was all over D'Angelo. And I loved and still oh. love D'Angelo. <laughs> so like when I started realizing, I'm like, holy crap, like I've been loving Jay Dilla for since middle school and I didn't even know it. Um, so learning where his influence was showed me that I had, had known him and respected him and liked his music way before I even knew any of it. Because growing up, I, I, there wasn't as much access to that, especially to somebody who never spent any time in music other than just listening to albums. So with you being the expert in creativity, my first question to you beyond authentically creative is, is everyone creative? Do we all have creativity inside of us? So you're just so you know, in having this conversation, you're helping me organize a bunch of my notes, which Great. I'm eternally grateful. But this is our conversation. So you help me put ideas together. That's part of your gift with asking questions like this. So when we were talking about this, I kept going back to this Natalie Nixon quote in my head. And she wrote an outstanding book a few years ago, I think on Cultish Creative, I actually said it was like my favorite business book of 2020 or 2019 or something when it came out. And she defines creativity in the book. And I, there's two definitions I want to give that are related on this. Mm -hmm. And I think this ties back to authentic creativity too. And that's, she defines it as the ability to toggle. So creativity is the ability to toggle between wonder and rigor in order to solve problems and to deliver novel value. I want to hit this again. Toggle creativity is the ability to toggle between wonder and rigor mm -hmm. in order to solve problems. Mm -hmm. So is everyone creative? If you can toggle between those two things mm -hmm. for a novel solution, you're creative. Mm -hmm. And that could be unclogging a toilet mm -hmm. or cleaning an air conditioner 
or driving the ice cream truck or building a house Mm -hmm. or recording an album, all of those take the rigor of getting it done and the wonder of imagining what's possible. So yes, everyone is creative and that's part of why Natalie Nixon's definition is so good. Mm -hmm. Now, I got one more wrinkle to add on that. And this, this comes from a quote that for the last like five, six years, tremendous personal change in my life. A lot of it I can stem back to reading Parker Palmer and some of his stuff. And he has this idea of the tragic gap. And I, I finally realized, I feel like within the last like week, how tied to creativity it is. Mm-hmm. Are, are you familiar with Parker Palmer and this idea? No. Have you ever run into this? No. Nope. Okay. Um, so Parker Palmer says, there's this gap that, it, that exists between the world that we know is possible and the world as it is. So hold wonder and rigor in your head for a second. So there's this world that we know is possible, and that's the land of like where we have our dreams and the things we can imagine. That's the world of wonder. And then we also have the world as it is. And the world as it is is the land of like logic and in our brain and stuff, our to-do lists, our checklists, like all the crap. And that's the world of rigor. And what Parker Palmer says is we are called to sit in that gap between the world that is possible, the world as it is, and sit in the middle of those two places to do solving problems, to do what Natalie Nixon is talking about. And if we tilt too hard to either side, and so everyone is creative. I'm going to tell you how everyone is not creative. Everyone is not creative when they tilt too hard to either one of those sides and get stuck. And so if you only go to the world as it, as it currently exists, Parker Palmer teaches that's when you devolve into corrosive cynicism. And if you spend all the time, you're the archetypal, archetypal, ugh, I don't even know what the word is, starving artist, like you're just writing teenage poetry and nobody reads it and no one cares and that's it and you're just sad about it. He calls that irrelevant idealism. If you're not toggling between wonder and rigor, if you're just stuck in one, you end up in corrosive cynicism or irrelevant idealism. And that's when you're not being creative. So, so long as you're doing this, as long as you're toggling, I really genuinely believe every single person is creative in that definition. I love both those definitions because they have nothing to do with what, man, this is just made where my mind goes, where I think most people go when they think about creativity and they, I think they, most people go to art and music and photography and like the creative arts. And I've always tried to say that you can be creative in the workplace, how you solve a problem. If everybody's solving a problem one way and you come up with another way, like that's creativity in the workplace. So I love those definitions because it has nothing to do with whether or not you're an artist or you can create music or you can write. It's about how you see the world and how you attack the world. Um, so I love those definitions. I think it's so important to define it that way. And if that means kind of like I said, authentic feels like an icky word to me, like creativity, I get it. Like I know people who, so you said something at the beginning and it reminded me. So especially like, like you're, I was in college, I'm studying music and I'm like, I wasn't at a solely music school. I was in a music school, but I'm around people studying like architecture and engineering and stuff like that too. And business. And they'd be like, oh, like we'd like music would be on. And they'd be like, oh, you appreciate, I bet you appreciate this so much more than I do. I hate that sentiment so much because I hate it because it's like, no, 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 no. You meet things at your level. You're pulled into your own tragic gap to understand these two things and then assess them with like wonder and rigor and what you want to do with it. You might... So it's funny, like you had your Dilla experience in the last couple of years. I had my Dilla experience in college where all of a sudden I realized like his fingerprints were all over all these things I loved because of my, one of my buddy and former bandmates, my friend Mike was just like, I remember him being like, oh, this is like when that Soul Quarians article came out, I remember him like being in us both like eyes bugging out of our head. <laughs> like, oh my God, all this happened together. Like these people were all in these same rooms because like all those tribe albums, it's just credit to the Uma. Like who the hell is the Uma? I don't know who the Uma is. Now going back and listening for it, like that. And we'll, we'll encourage everybody to go read the Jay Dilla book to find out who the Uma is. Like I don't like you got to go discover that because for many people it will mean nothing. But I bet the Uma will be eye opening to people who like 
appreciate hip hop and have listened to those things. And go. when they find out what it is, it'd be a little Easter egg. Like go, go look that up. Go find the Uma and look up the Soulquarians and understand this movement that they didn't name but got named and what it did. Yeah. So you appreciate this stuff at the level you are. You're called to sit in your own authentic, tragic gap. And tragic because these two worlds exist on two different sides. Wonder and rigor are definitionally separate. Mm-hmm. But no matter what your experience may be or your depth or fund of knowledge may be about either side of these extremes, like we can put on a piece of music or we can look at a clogged pipe again. And like I can watch the plumber assess that thing and work his way through it. I have no idea what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean I don't appreciate that he's here to fix my problem. Doesn't mean I don't appreciate what working pipes are. Mm-hmm. It just means I understand it at a different level. Mm-hmm. And in our own personal growth, isn't that's one of the most wonderful things in the world about helping people with creative pursuits mm-hmm. is sometimes you appreciate something later in a totally new way. Mm-hmm. And hey, you read The Alchemist a couple of times. Yep. It hit you a few different times or what? Yeah. So again, going back to, I don't necessarily research thoughts that I have real deep. I just get the thought and I go. And you're talking to you makes me want to like, okay, let's go substantiate the ideas that you have, Justin, and make sure like you can back it up. But the point of bringing that up is like when I originally started talking about creativity and in, in the pursuit and finding your authentic life, the reason I started talking about it was expressing myself create creatively through writing and podcasting and video has been a great guide to help me navigate my way. But what I realized too, I think, a, a, another definition of creativity is just like the art of creating, like taking something that doesn't exist and then making it exist. Like that's another way to look at creativity, which falls in to the definitions you gave. Like this is just a different, another way to look at it, a more surface level way to look at it. But as I think about that, I believe we all are creative. I believe we all have an inner creator. And I think that allowing that inner creator to express itself is an important part of finding your authentic self. Because within that creativity, I think we're, we're all given different ways to bring creativity to the world and that we're supposed to be doing that. So I think that creativity also has a spiritual component to it, which helps with the alignment of spirit, mind, and body. Because you know, regardless of your belief system, there is some creator that exists that made you come here, whether that is you know, the, the bearded God or, or various gods, or it was a boom or whatever it is. There was a creative being that created you, which was a creator in itself. And we are all created from the creator, put that inside of us. And the way I always try to bring people's attention to, yes, you are a creator is if you look at children, what does every child know how to do? Like basically from birth, the move that they can sit up, Kids know how to create. Like we are born with the ability to create something out of nothing as little children. It's already in us. It's in our DNA. It's in our you know genetic coding. We know how to take blocks and build a building. We know how to color. We know how to draw. No one teaches us that. So it's, it's in us. And then I think what happens is for a lot of us, not you, but for a lot of us, myself included, that creator gets like boxed up and put back on a shelf as you go through I don't want to blame the education system, but when you go through school and now the focus is, you know, sciences and maths and passing tests, there's not as much time for that creator and it gets kind of put away and it goes dormant. Um, so I do think we're all creative from a different angle than you are and that I think it's, it's built into us and that creativity, however it manifests itself, whether it's art or music or writing or whatever it might be, is a way for you to bring some of your new unique gifts to the world. And if you allow that creator out, it will help be a guide to kind of where your lane might be to where you can find what you do best, better than anybody else. So I think creating and finding time for it is really, really important for all of us. You got to find time for it. And I think, and everybody's going to stumble into which way they channel it, which way they get that inspiration via alignment, via a muse, via whatever it is. And, And I know for me, this is why I, Again, recent realization, but bolting on that Parker Palmer tragic gap idea. It's a seat that we were called to sit in, and it is between wonder and rigor. And I think that's like that's what they beat out of us in school, because they just want you to make these fractions work. And like wh- where's the creativity in that when like if I forget to sign my name on the line at the top, I fail the test or something. Like that'll beat 
that'll beat the wonder out of you real fast. And unless you find other alternate places to take that seat between those two areas, you're not going to figure out ways to solve new or interesting problems. And I'm sure like, I mean, like you, like me, probably like most people, it's like, yeah, they beat it out of you in class. And that's why so much of the real magic at school happens in the lunchroom or hanging out with your friends because that's where the room for wonder exists against all the rigor of school. That's an important thing too. It reminds you to find that seat or else you'll go friggin' crazy. And one final thing I'll, I'll add on my ramble a minute ago is, you know, the creative process, I don't necessarily believe that our inner creator necessarily needs to be our profession or our career. So, you know, as we're going to touch on later on, you have a belief that we should all be documenting things along the way. If your creative process is to journal every day or whatever it might be, that creative process helps you filter through thoughts and ideas and learn and grow. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we all need to be artists and musicians and that's our life's work. It's just that this creativity needs to come out to kind of filter through ideas and learn and that will help us on our on our pursuit. So um, I don't want it to be that oh, we should all just throw away our careers and go create. Um, for some people, maybe that's it, but not, not for everybody. And I, speaking of creating, I, I want to revisit some of your creative ventures through your life. So we haven't hit on that yet. Um, so it, you know, share with the audience some of the cool creative things that you have accomplished, and then we'll kind of back into how you got into it type stuff. But like maybe pick one or two creative things that you've done prior to being in the world of finance uh, that, uh, you know, help you become the great creator you are. <laughs> great creator. Uh, <laughs> and great creator meaning like people who are willing to be tremendously <laughs> uncomfortable in, a, in seeking alignment in something. So I think kind of like three formative things off the top of my head with this would probably be, so music at an early age and i was just talking to somebody else who was a professional performing artist for a long time about this today i'm sure you've heard like comedians when they talk about the reason they wanted they became comedians is they because they wanted to like hold peace in the room mm -hmm. have you ever hear, heard I this have, yeah i have yep okay this is a common thing with comedians and i think there's a variant on that that's really common with people who end up in music and this is not to say like i had a terrible childhood or like something like that but it is to say I have this very early young memory and I have pictures of it, which is really special of, so I'm the oldest of three. My parents were both the oldest of multi-sibling families. So like we have really consolidated or condensed ages in my family. Mm -hmm. um, I have a grandfather who's still alive. He's 93 years old. I'm 42. Do the math. Mm -hmm. Like we're friggin' close. Uh, and this is the same on both sides. And my parents were in their early 20s when they had me. So... A lot of my like aunts and uncles, we were almost like cousins in a way. Mm -hmm. So I'm the second grandkid in the family. We're going to grandma and grandma's house on like New Year's Eve, and it's not like grandpa's 80 years old. It's grandpa is not 40 yet <laughs> on that side of the family. My aunts and uncles are in like either in high school or some of them in college, but that's like the oldest of them. And like it's a party. And especially on my mom's side of the family, that meant. Everybody had guitars, everybody's singing songs, and everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. And it was the coolest thing in the world and imprinted on me at this young age to be like, this is what you do. You pick up a guitar, you sing some songs, you do this, it brings community together, and it just makes this like magical evening. And I've got this wonderful picture, I think it's on my about page on Cultish Creative, I think it might even be on my Twitter banner now, where it's... um. It's basically me with a plastic guitar at like three or three years old, mm -hmm. like standing in this circle of family members all standing around probably singing John Prine and Rolling Stone songs. But the, the creative journey starts by wanting to effectively communicate with your people. Mm -hmm. That happens at some point in all of our lives that we choose to want to communicate effectively, but that very grateful to say happened to me at a very young age through the medium of music. Mm -hmm. Flash forward uh, in high school and just because of the nature of the land, the area that I grew up in, which is like outside of Philly, outside of New York City, about two hours from each, northeastern Pennsylvania, the big bands aren't going to come here because they're going to go to Philly or New York. So they're not going to stop here. For whatever reason, we had a really thriving independent music scene in my town. Mm -hmm. So somehow middle school me is like 
there are bands playing with like high school kids like at these local coffee houses and all ages venues like why can't we do that good buddy of mine <laughs> like so we so we start a band and we start playing shows we start writing our own songs booking our own gigs and all this stuff um and then playing all over like the area like the tri-state area just because we could do that that meant and i like to ref reflect on this as it goes back to the financial services career that I ended up on much later. I got the business school, like MBA experience, playing in punk rock bands with my friends, coming up with music, recording our own stuff. And then I had this amazing opportunity when I was like 15 years old uh, to play in this cover band. Mm -hmm. And so it was all older professional musicians and we got to travel around a lot. And I played it like everything from like weddings to corporate events to you name it and played like all this classic soul and Motown and jazz and all these other things. And that taught me the business side of like existing in music. Mm -hmm. So I had my, how to connect and communicate effectively with like my friends and my peers. Then I learned how to do that with people older than me. And I learned about contracts and I learned about forming businesses and all that stuff along the way. Um, and then that took me to college and it was just like, we'll blow this all out. Like you get to college in my case, you know, this, this is the source of so many things. You're trying to impress some new friends or whatever. And next thing you know, you have a new band and you're putting out some records and touring all over the East coast. Mm -hmm. So fun, creative stuff is a journey every step of the way to effectively communicate with your people. And as you understand this more and more, you figure out ways to better talk to bigger and more exciting people. That's the off the top of my head overview of that. You tell me if you have other questions. I know we've gone down all sorts of rabbit holes on this stuff before together. I wrote down one quote I want to bring back, but I also, sure. I think you left one, like there's one specific creative um, accomplishment that I wanted to highlight. A rumor has it that there, like you might have an album on Spotify. Is that right? So one at least one of the things exists on Spotify from the label that put it out from the college mat days. So I can officially say I've been, I was alive as long before that album as I think after that now, which is a funny thing to realize. Um, but yeah, there's some stuff on Spotify. There's some stuff on like Bandcamp. The pandemic was great. I got reconnected with a bunch of my old music friends and other people like in that life and world. And, um, yeah, there's there's some stuff out there if you know how to sleuth and you can get an idea for, you know, why I never became a drummer <laughs> and also what what level of word nerd I actually am. <laughs> uh, I love it. The quote I wanted to go back to when you were talking about when you were growing up and you saw the local you know high school kids playing, you said to yourself, well, why can't I do that? And I have said that a lot once I unlocked my creator. And I wonder if that approach that belief that way of viewing things is a common characteristic of people who tend to be more creative from the standpoint of well if that person could do it like why can't i um i don't know if you have any extended thoughts on that but i just thought it was interesting that you said that and like when i think about so when my inner creator unlocked was when i started writing so i wanted to write a blog i launched my firm um, Josh Brown's reform broker is what really turned me on to, to financial blogging. And I was like, well, if he's doing it. Why can't I? So all about your Benjamins. And I start writing and I find my way there again, it, to your point, exploring ways to communicate. I tried to write like a bunch of other people. And then I finally found my voice. And then it was, I loved, uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy's invest like the best podcast. Like I never missed an episode. And I thought, well, if he's doing a podcast, why can't I? So then all about your Benjamins, the podcast comes and I just keep on when I see people doing things. I don't know why I can't do it myself. And if there's enough interest, then I'm going to go try it. And now that doesn't mean I'm always su successful, but I'm still going to go try it. So anyways, that why can't we do that? Why can't I do that? Do you think that is an important perspective that a lot of creative people have? So I think that's extremely important. And this is, this is kind of wild because I think you actually just, you just made a connection in my brain on this. So you always want to find people who are like that three steps ahead of you thing. And so part of the reason too, like I left this big firm with a compliance department. I couldn't do anything on social media. And you were one of the people that I was like, Justin is doing stuff. I like the way he's sharing and communicating these things. 
how do I, I need to go befriend Justin because I need to learn some of the stuff that he's doing and you're helping give people like me permission to go out and do what we want to do. Um, my, my, my friend, Angie Coley, fantastic book on this called Permission to Kick Ass just came out on her 40th birthday a couple weeks ago. Hard plug for that. It's so friggin' good. So, all right. So you got to find the people three steps in front of you or five or 10 or a couple miles, whatever, but you have to find somebody that makes what you want to do attainable. Not like, like you can't be like, oh, I want to be, you know, Keith Richards and just like assume there's a straight line to, from me to becoming Keith Richards because he's already Keith Richards. Like he's got years and decades on of life on you and experience. Like you're not going to follow that same path, but you can directionally orient in this way. So I'm like in middle school and maybe elementary school, somewhere in there, like church school, summer camp, where you go away for the week and like they tell you to read the Bible and nobody ever reads the Bible except me because the word nerd thing again, but you're just hanging out. And, you know, I have this girlfriend who then lives like, you know, 45 minutes away or something. And we held hands once and it's that kind of a thing. But, um, this girl's sister, older sister was dating a drummer in a band that I used to see the stickers for around town. And I was like, holy crap, like that band is like, they're like high school kids. They're not like 40 year old rock stars on TV. They're just like local high school kids who has a band and they have shirts and they have stickers and they have all this stuff. And like, it felt attainable. So th th this is what's crazy about this that I hadn't really thought of in this perspective. So thanks to dating this girl who remains a friend to this day, I ran into her at the grocery store with her kids the other day, it was kind of funny. Um, because of her sister in this thing, like this guy was just on my radar and we end up bumping into each other. We actually meet at this jazz thing when I'm like in high school and he's finishing up college. He's playing this Buddy Rich drum suite thing and we get to talk a little bit afterwards. And at this time I'm already playing in some some of my own bands and stuff. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah. Like we, I saw you guys on something or whatever and we got to talking and became friendly. We end up playing in that like soul review cover corporate gig band together, like spent years together. I was looking up to him from when I was in like, like I said, like like fifth grade. And I was looking up to him because he was a few steps ahead. And he was always just like a little bit older and a little bit more advanced on this creative journey. And that was always like validation, like, especially once you have somebody who's right there looking back at you and saying, yeah, like, come, come on, like, you can, you can do this too. Like, clearly, if I can do it, anybody can do it. All you have to do is want it, but you got to find those role models to follow. Is that, I mean, I think that rhymes with like you and Josh Brown and that old story too. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, and I, I have so many mentors. I mean, I, I've met oh, yeah. Josh and Josh Countless. has become a friend, but I have so right. many mentors that I will never meet. I mean, hopefully I will. Like I've got Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine looking over my shoulder right here. Like I bought an old wired magazine from when, I don't, from back in the day, maybe when the Beats deal went down and it's just the two of them. Um, so yeah, I, I have these so people cool. that I look up to and I just pull inspiration from them, whether that is, you know, like trying to, to approach the things that I want to do in a way that is similar to them. I think there's original creators and, and then maybe there's no real original creator. But what I mean by that is somebody who can create just from their own idea. That's oh, wait, 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 hold on. Go, go back to this for a second. Cause yeah. I think it's an important differential mm -hmm. between like you reaching out to say like Josh Brown on your own career arc and like Dr. Dre. Right. And, and so beyond the clear unrelated things um, in industry and whatever career path choice, you didn't just look up to like the, you directionally oriented yourself with like the biggest of the big for inspiration. But then you also found somebody who was like an attainable amount of steps ahead of you at the time mm -hmm. to make that connection to help drive that motivation of like, here's the path in the snow I can follow. Mm -hmm. And maybe you need both of those. I think that's that's part of what I'm thinking here. What do you think? I would I would agree. And, but the thing is, when I first identified Josh and started to really follow him and look up to him, I didn't think he was attainable. So it wasn't oh, like, 100%. oh, there's Dr. Dre, I'll never meet him, and oh, there's Josh Brown, like I'll get to meet him one day. Um, it's yeah, just yeah. that kind of it just naturally evolved. Um, so yeah, I do think that there are there is the need to have different distances from the people that you're looking up to, um, which is one of my hopes for this podcast is like one day I want this podcast to be where I can have Rick Rubin on. 
I can have Kendrick Lamar and Jay Cole, and they'll be guests, and they'll have a great, we'll have a great conversation, and they will be inspirational to the audience. But they'll be inspirational at a level that I think it doesn't make you feel like you can go do what they're doing. But then I want to have you on. I want to have you know someone like my wife, somebody who that you know this is no because I'm in this category. This is not meant to be offensive or a backhanded compliment, but somebody whose story is more attainable because we're quote unquote normal. We're not Kendrick Lamar. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. so yeah. if I want to be able to do both because that story is going to be inspirational and I selfishly want to meet them. And then, but that's not going to move the needle on somebody pursuing their authentic life. But hearing your story or hearing my wife's story or other stories I have coming up, those are going to be more attainable because they don't seem too far removed. So I do think you need to have both. You need to have the inspiration of like what could happen. And also those people are at that level because they have a level of creativity and execution that a lot of us don't. So it's just aspiring to see like what they did and try to pull a little bit into that and be your own, but then have somebody that you can look up to that isn't so far removed that you don't think you can do it. Like, I think I could sit down and mess around on GarageBand and maybe make a beat. I can't make a Dr. Dre beat. So like, he's not, I'm not going to be inspired to that. But if I sat down and watched you make a beat and I go, Matt's not that, I mean, he's more are musical than I am, but he was able to do it. Like maybe I could do a little bit better and be closer to Matt. So I do think we need to have both. Um, what I was going to, what I was going to go to is that the, the types of creators, and I would be interested in your perspective and what you have to say to this. I don't consider myself an original creator. I am, you know, there's the saying steal like an artist. I am somebody who pulls creativity, pulls my inspiration most of the time from other people. So I don't, copy other people but i look at what they have done as inspiration to me and then i figure out how could i do something similar but in my own way and maybe you would be able to tell where the influence came from but it's definitely not copying that individual because i don't think we should copy others like i i think there are people who can sit down in front of a blank a blank garage band and create a beat out of nothing and then there's somebody like me who's going to hear that beat and maybe starts to make some tweaks and then creates a beat that doesn't sound like the original, but it started from that foundation. All right, I know you heard that intro music and you knew that meant an interruption was coming out. Keep this quick. I apologize for interrupting that great conversation, but we've mentioned the daily notes a couple times already in this conversation. And I just wanted to make sure you were aware of the daily note that I write, obviously each day. The daily note is something I've been writing for almost a year now with the goal of processing thoughts of my own to share with others, helping people align their spirit, mind, body, and money, thinking about creativity, ultimately to help them find and pursue their authentic life. They're usually short notes. They come out every single day. You can subscribe to it at my website, justincastelli.io. I have chosen to have no pop-up, so scroll to the bottom of the page, put your email in, and you'll get an email from me every day with something to think about, uh, maybe some th questions to answer to help you move closer to your authentic life, align your spirit, mind, body, and money, and find the life that you were meant to live. All right, let's get back to the conversation with Matt. Does the name Breakbeat Lou or Ultimate Beats and Breaks mean anything to you? I told you, man, you intimidate the hell out of me. No, I've never heard oh, God of that. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Rolodex is mostly useless information. Okay, man, I, I, I'm going to find like a Breakbeat Lou inter interview and just like break your brain with this. So this is really, really important. And I think it's really important to what you said. And this is also where like our own patterns and cycles, we can go back and find stuff. Like more of the, it's it's all buried in your backyard and whatever your interests are, it's all there. If you're willing to go be curious, if you're aware to go like express wonder on this and then rigorously search through you to find lots of answers to this. This is a metaphor I like to think of. The creativity, and I'm, I'm gonna invoke Virgil Abloh because I know you love him too. Like 3% change confers ownership. It's not stealing so long as you use something for growth. So a couple of amazing things about Breakbeat Lou and uh, Lenny Roberts, his partner. So in the 70s into the 80s, when the hip hop thing starts in basements and parks and everything else, the problem was, so like you have the two turntables and you're basically going to, you're going to juggle a beat, you're going to find the break. And then with two turntables, you're going to go back and forth and we can debate who did it first and all this good stuff. But the idea was like you needed two of a record that had a special couple of bars on it that people would lose their minds to and then you sync it up to go back and forth so that means like just think about the economics of this for a second <laughs> to come up with a breakbeat live on the spot at your park jam 
you need two records. Now, maybe you're going to stretch that out for a couple of minutes, but you still need two records to do that thing. If you start to think about how are you going to play a one hour or a two hour or like a six hour party, you start to realize you need a lot of friggin' records. The near illegal genius of what they did is they started to basically gather all the records people wanted to use for breaks for these parties. And they made like the original like compilation disc and disc here meaning vinyl records. So ultimate breaks and beats becomes the original breakbeat library on vinyl. There's a handful of volumes that had like out of the thousands of records you needed to own, it was like if you had four of these Ultimate Breaks and Beats records, and let alone if you had a pair of them, uh, you could rock a multi-hour party with all the hottest breaks. So the first like decade of sampled hip hop, when we moved from drum machine into sampling, so in particular from like the mid '80s, especially early to mid '80s into like the mid '90s, like those records are everything. Because everybody used them. And that's why we hear the same drum breaks and the same stuff over a time. To your point, are these original creators because they're taking the funky drummer and flipping it for the first or the 50th time? I would say they are so long as they're coming up with something novel. That doesn't mean it lasts till the end of the time, but it means it's a novel thing. The more novel you're willing to become through your desire for effective communication with your audience key, key, key part. The better you are at that, the more creative you can get, the more durable that message is going to become. And so I don't think it's a matter of being an original creator or not, but I'll take it to like what, so what De La Soul and Prince Paul and them all did, especially on that first album and then the, then the second album, but really that first album is that was Three Feet High and Rising is one of the first records that basically, and this happens in the eighties, that instead of using the stuff from Ultimate Breaks and Beats, like hard left. De La is one of the first groups to go through like their parents' old record collections. And it's like the Turtles and weird TV show stuff and everything else ends up on this record. And like people were like, we didn't even know that was an option. We didn't know when you were allowed. We thought you had to stick to these tried and true things that you did. Every layer of 3% confers ownership, whether it's 3% or 100%, it's just about how durable is that creative solution that you've made and how effective is it communicating to your audience how how much value it actually has in your novel discovery. So I, I understand what you're saying, but just look at the history of sampling. Look at Virgil writing brick on my brick, as they said. There's so much room for this. Don't, yeah, just don't pigeonhole into that. Well, and I don't I'm, like that. I'm, I'm glad you went down. I'm glad I brought that up. I'm glad you went down that because I think a lot of people say, I'm not creative. And a big part of my message is like your words and your thoughts begin to shape your reality. If you say you're not creative, then you're never going to be creative because you won't believe it. You'll never like manifest that. But if you realize that creativity doesn't mean you have to create something brand new from scratch, you can take something that is attractive to you or that speaks to you and then 3% change it to now create something new, you are in fact creative. And I think the more you tap into that, the more creativity you spur and you and you see yourself as a creative. So I didn't know that's where we were going to go with all that, but I'm glad I brought that up um, and that we kind of got there. Um, you know, thinking of creators like Virgil and some of the people you mentioned, what are some traits and characteristics that you identify with the people that you think are the the best creatives, if, we, if there is a best. So I think this is the common thread. And I just, I just wrote a post about this the other day. I, I have these like five Ps that I think every cre creator exhibits. And I think like, I, this is not a challenge on the spot for you to put me through the ropes on this one. But like, I think if you understand these, if you start to ask these five questions about whatever anybody you think is creative is doing, I think you can understand a lot. And the five P's are uh, practice, performance, persistence, patience, and patterns. And we could go through each of these, but like if we just use like, um, go ahead, you, you pick. Let's do something fun on the spot. Anything from any domain that you think is creative. Be as weird as you want because you're going to answer the questions if I have no clue who this person is. 
It doesn't have to be music. Like go just, anywhere. Just, I pick the person and you're going to go through the five P's of that person? Yeah, yeah let's do it. Why not? <laughs> um, let's see. Let's go um, Basquiat. Okay. Very limited in my Basquiat knowledge. Oh, so I mean, this is what you're going to do. I just know so I like his work. I, I know a little bit of the background. I, just, I know I love his work. <laughs> Perfect. If we have to start Googling things, we'll go full Joe Rogan on this. Um, do you think, so when you think about Basquiat practicing, like what did he have to practice to do the work that he did? I think he said to practice getting ideas out on paper. Okay. Like just literally getting it onto the page. I think so. Yeah. All right. We're going to do the lightning round of this. So we're not going to go too deep on any of these and the Basquiat fans can, uh, we'll give them your Twitter handle. At the end of it. They, can, they can come chasing you down. Okay. The performance aspect. And I say performance here meaning show work. Performance does not mean you fill the stadium with people. Mm -hmm. It just means practice is me putting it on the page for myself. Mm -hmm. Performance is I show at least one other person that thing. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea of like, how did he start like sharing his work with the public? Do you have any idea? I mean, I know we see it all over the place now. Yeah. I don't, think like graffiti is the right way to say it, but I think there was kind of like just public public art and then just showing it out there. Um, and again, my my I've not spent a lot of time diving into it, but I'm thinking of, I went to the exhibit when it was in New York City. Um, oh, and cool. like, it's really cool because what they did was they created, obviously they have his artwork displayed, but some of the rooms were created to look like his workspace. So it's oh, like they awesome. have like scraps of paper that were honestly, that were, there were real scraps of his paper on the ground of the drawings that he did. So that's why I think that it was just, he had to get it out on paper and there's all these images and then from there is where it builds. And I, and I know that like, you know, being in New York City, there's an art scene. So I don't know if it was he, like people just started to see it, um, but he definitely was creating the, the work and putting it where people could see it. Okay, so you've already hit the third P, which is persistence. Mm -hmm. So that mix of like creating in private sharing in public as performance and then persistently doing both. Mm -hmm. And this is key. If all you do is practice, but you never perform, that's that's a problem. Mm -hmm. If all you do is perform, but never practice, and you can perform and practice a little bit at the same time, mm -hmm. but you have to persistently do it. Beyond that, and I don't know what the turnaround time, but I feel like Basquiat was doing this for a good while, which is the P number four is patience. Mm -hmm. Like he was at it before he became household name, right? And I don't not even so sure he didn't become a household name until after he died, honestly, which is a lot of the case did. with a lot of yeah. artists. And then obviously yes. recently Jay Z's blown his name up, and like I think a lot right. of people now know him before. So the, and I'll be completely honest, I don't think I was aware of Basquiat because I wasn't really tapped into art. Like I appreciate art a lot more now, until maybe Jay Z and maybe a little bit before that. But the, what, what I realized was that when I made the connection of the artist Jay-Z was talking about and I started to go look at his work. It was work that I had liked for years. Like I didn't know that I liked Basquiat's work because I didn't know who Basquiat was. But here, once I found out who he was, I was like, oh, I, I've been, I've liked that style for a long time. I bought a Peloton sweatshirt way back in the day that had this image on it. It was a Basquiat Peloton sweatshirt. I didn't even know it. So I, like, so again, to the ba the Basquiat lovers and fans, I'm not claiming to know everything about him. I just have always appreciated his work, and I appreciated it much like Jay Dilla before I even realized and knew who he was, which I think is kind of cool in some some regards. I think it's super cool, and it's patience on both parts. Your part as like the audience and consumer, but patience on his that he had to keep he had to keep putting stuff out there. He had to keep practicing. He had to keep performing. He had to have the persistence. He had to have the patience while he was doing it just to let it like work. Mm -hmm. And then the last piece is like patterns. And so what, what narrowly I do know about Basquiat is like, like the quality of art itself. He's got a bunch of like themes and patterns. He is consistently exploring. Mm -hmm. you, you want to comment on some of the patterns as a non-art critic you see in his work? I don't know if this is the angle you're going to, but I feel like, his, I mean, that's a Basquiat painting that's on a skate deck that behind me that's kind of blurry right now. I, I mean, I think that, like, I think about his style, it looks very, I'm going to say elementary, and that is not the right way to framework it, but it looks like something that anybody could do. Like, it was very rough and raw, and it wasn't, like, realistic, um, it was, and there was, a, there was a lot of social issues in it as well, um, that he addressed like his beliefs through it as well. So, um, I don't think I really answered your question. Um, but like the, when I think about his work, I think about 
raw. I think about a little bit um, kind of you as the viewer get to choose what you see in it as well. So a little abstractness to it, but not so abstract. It's just like paint thrown on it. It's just like the shapes. It's not, it's not realistic. It's not lifelike, but at the same time, you know what it is that you're looking at. Bright colors, um, hidden messages. Like I, I just, I think I like the, I'm going to say chaotic. I don't think chaotic is the right framework for it, but to, when I look at it, there's a lot going on. It's busy. And I like that component to it. And then um, the style is unique to him. And you see a lot of people now kind of mimicking that style, trying to do their own 3% changes to kind of make it their own. But it, you, you know who's been inspired by Basquiat. And I think an important part of this is it's in the contrast. And that's a lot of times where we see the pattern. Mm -hmm. And it's important to think of it this way, because instead of like looking for this like neatly interwoven, perfect braid of a pattern, we look for like the jarring frayed edges of this. Mm -hmm. And this is like, like why does like old dirty bastard stand out so much against so many other things? It's just, it's such a jarring presentation of a familiar form, but in a way that jumps out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And part of that performance, part of that practice, part of understanding the audience that you're doing this for and the effect of communication is figuring out a pattern that stands out against the other patterns. Mm -hmm. And like, that's, that's like a prime example of like Basquiat and what he was doing because it's, it's a really distinctive creative voice that he had. And again, I, I probably need to learn a little bit more about him than like a handful of his art. That's probably all over the place and probably like you, like post Jay Z, mm -hmm. but it's all interwoven. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, wasn't he, was it, wasn't he like most active in like the eighties? Yeah. Yeah. And he was like, so, but so well, going back to not being a household name, he was well known within like the celebrities. So like he was hanging with all the celebrities at the parties and, and everything in New York city. So he was, he was well known amongst that crowd. Uh, but a household name wasn't where he resided back then. Yeah. And I think this is really important too, because this is the other reminder is just because something evolves into household name status or gets big or popular or blows up or whatever word you want to call it, the act of creating and for the community, no matter how small that enjoys this novel solution to the problem mm -hmm. that you sat in the tragic gap between wonder and rigor mm -hmm. and like delivered some novel solution to the group. Mm -hmm. I don't think your goal should be to become a household name through your creating. Like, I think you should be creating because you're in that gap and you feel called to do it and you're doing what you enjoy. And that in itself is worth the time and energy spent creating. And if anything beyond that happens, then that's like the cherry on top, which I think is a good segue into our buddy, Rick Rubin. So I told you I was going to give you some quotes because some of the things were tip were like tiptoeing around, like he goes in and addresses front and center so his book the creative act a way of living or way of being is a book i know we both love um because we've talked about it before so i picked a few quotes and we won't spend too much time on them because there's a few more things i want to get to before we start hitting joe rogan length of podcast times um, <laughs> i lose everybody but i want to get your reaction to some of these quotes um and it's connected to some of the things i feel like you have something else you want to end the basquiat conversation on before i go to those so what's what's the thought on the tip of your tongue oh, um just identity. Just don't let your identity be defined by some like larger than life goal. If you want it to be defined by that, then that is going to guide your choices. Mm -hmm. But for most of us, the pure creative act is not to have the identity beyond some outcome. The identity is tied to the process of being creative. Okay. All right. Very Rick Rubin of you. So we'll, <laughs> you go. <laughs> we'll go to the, the first quote. Uh, we are all translators for the message for messages. The universe is broadcasting. The best artists tend to be the ones with the most sensitive antenna to draw in the energy resonating at the particular moment. And then he continues with, if your antenna isn't sensitively tuned, you're likely to lose the data in the noise. So this concept of us all having antennas and receiving these signals that help spur our creativity. That's the muse talking to you or whatever higher plane spirit, whatever you want to think of, or you can see it as coming from yourself. I don't care. I just care that you care. And that's that sense of wonder. The sense of wonder is curiosity, and the curiosity is what drives you to scratch the proverbial itch, right? <laughs> Whatever it is, and that's that's the antenna. 
the brilliance of Ruben, like the meta level to this, and this is why it's great. This book just isn't about like his trials and tribulations in the music industry, but there's other great books about that stuff for, for people who are interested, is understanding his job was to help the artist just be the antenna and transmit the signal as it was received from that muse. And then his job was to just clear the way I almost think of it like, I mean, you're you're as old as I am, I think. So like, you remember like rabbit ears on the TV and everything, or like you have to move stuff around the living room so that like the signal's clear so you can watch the game. Um, and, and it's that kind of thing. Like his job was to run around the room, was to be dad and go like, okay, like I'm going to fix this so we can see the Penn State game this weekend because, uh, you know, the Christmas tree's in the way when we set up for Christmas. And I mean, that's like him with Johnny Cash. I love Johnny Cash. I want to reinvigorate somebody's career. How do I do this? Well, you know what makes sense? Like, just put a microphone in front of the guy and the guitar and get everybody else out of here. And here we are years later. Brilliant. We both have talked about, on our own, publicly, wanting to be a, like, a version of Rick Rubin within what it is that we do in finance. So, like, the way I think about it is everybody has this authentic life that is within them. A lot of people don't know it. They haven't found it. And I want to do what Rick Rubin does with his artists, with individuals, helping them find their authentic life. So helping move that antenna around and help them strengthen their signals so they can tap into who they're really supposed to be and then put on financial advisor hat or introduce to financial advisor to build the plan for it. Uh, but I love that quote because that concept of an antenna resonates with me in my daily notes because I write a daily note. I'm on 355 days in a row. I've never done anything with that consistency before. And I never pre-write them. And I write them every morning. Now, they're not long pieces. Sometimes it's a quote. Sometimes it's not. But it's like every morning I wake up, not nervous. I'm excited to, figure, to, to go downstairs and figure out what's today note, today's note going to be. And I sit down and it's like I download the message for the day. And I even drew on a flight one time in this notebook an image of what was supposed to be me sitting down at a table with a notebook. And I drew like a version of this source over my head, like putting the ideas in my head is like that's the way the daily notes work. I don't, I don't actually write the daily notes. I download and interpret from some higher power, a, a message that's supposed to go out. And most of the time, the daily notes are written for me. Like, it's like, okay, I'm downloading this message that I need to hear, but I'm going to write it so other people can. And, and for some days it's going to hit and some days it won't, but it's really cool. But it, it really does feel like I download and I have this antenna, which feeds into, this isn't one I want to dive into, but I love how, how Rick talks about how, you know, sometimes we'll get an idea and the idea will leave us and somebody else will go like somebody else will steal your idea. And he says, it's not, it was never your idea to begin with. And that idea came to you. You weren't ready to bring it to life. So it moved on to the next person who was ready to bring that idea to life. So because I'm sure we all can think of things that like, oh, I thought of that, but somebody else did it. Like, yeah, you probably had that idea, but it wasn't the right time for you to bring it to life. So it moved on to somebody else who had the antenna to pick that frequency up and then bring it to life. I think that's a, a really cool like idea. So I love this whole like Rick Rubin, the wonderkin philosopher thing that we have going on right now mm -hmm. because he is, and that's like part of the special part about him. I think, and I, I don't know how much of this stuff you know, but I, like without knowing it, you've intuitively picked up on this. So I just want to put it on the surface. Like the, the rigor, to use that word again, mm -hmm. of Rick Rubin is real. So like there's the business side of Rick Rubin and I mean, do you, have you, do you know any of the stories about like some of the historic, like career misses that he has, like groups he didn't sign when he was an A&R and all that stuff? I mean, surface level stuff. Most of my stuff has been creative act or creative, creative act really put me back into him. I mean, I knew him from you're crazy for this Rick and you know, Jay-Z, like I've known who he is, sure. but never yeah, dove yeah. into it. And then, um, I, I think the book and then also my spiritual journey made me want to listen to him more. So I've gone back and listened to interviews, but I couldn't tell you a big miss that he had. Um, so no, I don't know all of those. All right. This is important because there's like on the rigor side of the business, so you can have wonder and go around wanting to have great ideas and exciting, interesting connections all day long, mm -hmm. but you got to actually freaking do something about it. So he starts, you know, 
Def Jam famously in the in the dorm room and all that stuff happens. Then you have the big label divide, the fallout with the Beastie Boys and all the crazy drama that goes down. And he ends up with uh, Deaf American becomes his label. He goes out to the West Coast. Other just sorry, this is a, just such a cool detail that I feel like a lot of people don't know. Um, when he's on Deaf American for I want to say the bulk of the '90s, his primary A and R was this guy named Dan Charnas. Do you recognize that name? Mm-mm. Dan Charnas is the guy who wrote the Dilla book. <laughs> oh, is it really? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people don't know. Like he was, he was like the main A and R, like working with Rick Rubin for probably like a decade. Wow. Um, through this period, so D- Dan Charnas tells the story about like one of the groups that they missed signing was House of Pain. And forgive me because I'm stealing somebody else's story to tell it, but I just like I I've been thinking about this all the time lately. So like. They get the House of Pain demo pre-Jump Around, right? But Jump Around's on the demo. It's like the whole album's done, but like they're shopping it for for a label to put out. And again, this is on the rigor side. So it's not about like the wonder of let's go create new art. It's we have a label that needs to release music to sell into the world so that we can go out and find the next artist because this is a business. So they get the House of Pain demo. Dan Charnas listens to it. Rick Rubin listens to it. They're like, they get on the phone with each other and um, and Dan basically says something to him along the lines of like, it's good. That jump around song is is amazing, but I don't, I don't think there's another song on this record. <laughs> like, I think that's it. And, uh, and Rick's comment is like, yeah, a lot of jumping. <laughs> and so they don't sign House of Pain. They don't put out the record. They don't end up doing the you know everlasting years to, years to follow and all the other things that come out of that group and everything else. Um, but like this is the matter of like matching up the rigor behind the wonder. You can have the ideas, the antenna can channel the thing down, but then somebody has to go out and do it in the world. And there's good ideas all the time. Lots of stuff is going to miss you by, uh, pass you by, extra far side, and. That's just the reality of life. And even the Rick Rubens and the Dan Charnases of the world are going to miss on an enormous amount of those things. And we get that because of like the markets experience. We know how hard it is to beat markets and all that other crap. But it's like, yeah, even in these professions. And then look what happens. Now Rick Rubin is a best-selling author and you didn't even know that Dan Charnas is right-hand man for all those years wrote this Dilla book you right. read. <laughs> how cool is that? Yeah. And, it, and it's cool to see all these like connections that unfold on these things. All right, next quote. Follow your own excitement, not the audience's. Followed up with be aware of the being aware of the audience your as you're making your work changes it. And I, I'll share why I picked that one. I like that because when at least for me, when I first started creating, and I think a lot of people who are trying to start, maybe they want to start a blog or whatever it might be, they're trying to think about writing for a specific audience. And I think there's value in knowing your audience, but I found it to be a lot easier to create what motivates and excites me. So like the days that I would sit down and write and it would flow out was because I had this idea I was excited about and I just sat down. The days where I sat down because I scheduled time to sit down, I need to write something. It was like pulling teeth to get the idea. So I think that at least starting out, follow and create what excites you And then like later on, the audience who wants that will find you. And then you just get to create. When you're trying to create for other people first, I think it becomes a lot harder. So I would agree with Rick's perspective there. I talk to a lot of people about this pretty regularly. And anybody who works with like a marketing firm or is trying to figure out stuff or you're trying to like, I want to start a blog and reach people or write a newsletter or something. And they're like, okay, who? Who is this for? Who's it for? What's it do? And these are these big sacred questions. And what I'd like to publicly go on the record as saying is stop worrying about who Mm -hmm. in the broad defined, predefined sense. Go out and do something, play, experiment, and let who come to you. Mm -hmm. And you got to follow those interests to do it. And then the more tuned in you get on like what's working, the more you do it. Um, You and I talking like maybe not a year ago, but a long time ago about like Rick Rubin and some of the other stuff. I've been realizing I've only been able to share stuff in public for the last like just over a year with my name on it. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of the last year was realizing, oh, people actually respond when I talk about all this music stuff. I like who 
who cares? Like, mm-hmm. like you're telling me this and I want to be like, yeah, you know, it's a cool story about listening to your audience. So, uh, a tribe called quest Q-tip before they do, um, the third album before midnight marauders Q-tip is DJ in clubs and the song don't walk away boy by Jade is this like colossal dance it. Mm-hmm. And that's like totally like sorority girl anthem, whatever <laughs> else. And Q-tip is like the bass on that song just like breaks his brain and he gets so excited. And so what's wild is, and I had no idea about this until just recently, um, the bass line to the song Award Tour on Midnight Marauders is basically the Don't Walk Away Boy by Jane wow. bass line. <laughs> and he was just like, no, I'm walking by nightclubs in New York. That bass line slays me every time I hear it. I know it works in a crowd, so I wanted to have a song that it worked in. And back to 3% confers ownership and just the idea of you, you got to let who come to you. Mm-hmm. And that requires you go out and play and learn how to effectively communicate in different audiences. Mm -hmm. So when people want to start something, something I always say back is write down those areas of interest, Mm -hmm. figure out where there's already a gathering of people in those areas, and then just go interact with them. Mm -hmm. Find out if you can effectively communicate any idea. And then like this weird cross section of like finance and music, um, I do a lot of collaborating with like Epsilon Theory and Ben Hunt now. Mm-hmm. And like, did I tell you like why that ended up happening as far as like what what thing I wrote, Ben was like, we got to work together. What was it? The, the subject matter was about Ice Cube, the rapper, <laughs> <laughs> and about something that happened to Ice Cube in college or in high school. And like, I told a story about it and he was like, we got to do some stuff with this. That's we awesome. got to work on some stuff together. So your interests, what attracts you will open other doors. And the more effective you get at communicating it, the more you can be like Q-tip and hear a pop song and be like, that's gold. I need to take that. Mm -hmm. The the better it becomes for you and the who you serve, Mm -hmm. which if it's really great, it might grow. Mm -hmm. And if it does great, you might do something with it. And if it doesn't, you might just make five people really happy. And that's really friggin' cool too. Mm -hmm. All right. Final Ruben quote, execute every idea even the bad ones, you may be surprised. What's the quote in the book about how, how many mistakes is it that he says you have to make? Do you remember uh, off the top of your head? Uh, it's like, there's a quote in the book somewhere is like, you have to make, I don't know, it's like you should make at least five or 13 or seven mistakes or something. And I love this. Like nothing is perfect. So just make all the mistakes you can mm-hmm. in an act of exploration and then see where that lands you. Mm-hmm. And until you've made some mistakes, until you've pushed something too far or tried something too left the field, like you gotta, you gotta come back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also rooted in from the world of music production in this idea of like, and there's a million examples of this. Somebody will record a demo for something, and then they'll go out and try to create the song or do whatever with it. And sometimes you have to know enough to say we hired the orchestra we did all this stuff there's a famous adele story i think with rick rubin on this exact idea it was like they had the orchestra they had the philharmonic they flew all over the world they did 18 different things but her at a tour stop on a piano backstage with a microphone that was the album that ended up going on the record and winning the grammy and somebody had to step back and say that was the one that was the magic that quote makes me think of like perfect is the enemy of great so like you to your thing nothing's perfect even the best things there's flaws in it but the other thing a part of it <laughs> just is just keep zooming in you'll find a flaw yeah and, and also like that the i think the point of being surprised could be you could be surprised that what you didn't think was good ends up being good because he goes on in other areas of the books and talks about it's not you the artist's job to determine if it's good or bad it's the audience right. so while you may think it's bad somebody else may think it's really good and if it's the right person who thinks it's really good Oprah thinks it's really good. Now, all of a sudden, everybody thinks it's good. Uh, But also, that could be one outcome of the surprise. But the other surprise could be, okay, it really does suck. But in creating that bad piece of work, it helped you unlock something to create the good piece of work. Like the good piece of work had to sit behind the bad piece of work. You couldn't have gone there without having something that wasn't good. But you had to create it to get to the next step. So I just I hate seeing so many people want to do something but not go forward because they're afraid it's not going to be good enough or they're waiting for the perfect time when the reality of it is like, just go do it and go do it because you want to do it because you feel called to and do it with little to no expectations. So then that way you just get to do it and put it out there and you learn and maybe it blows up, 
but maybe it doesn't and you do it again and you do it again and it becomes to be what it's supposed to be you got to fall in love with the process yep. if you fall in love with the outcome like whether or not you achieve it that'll wreck your identity but if yeah. your identity is tied up in you falling in love with the process mm -hmm. and writing the daily note or doing stuff like that like that just becomes if you fall in love with doing the thing and then just doing the thing makes you happy then yeah if it finds the right audience it might resonate mm -hmm. and there's there's methods and marketing and tactics um this whole methodology i like to call punk rock economics about like those tactics and how you go out and stress test them but it's you got to fall in love with that process mm -hmm. first and foremost more than anything else and that's one of the easiest ways to be happy one thing i want to hit on before we get into a couple of your things i want to drive attention to i guess to, to summarize this conversation about creativity like why do you believe it's important for people to tap into their creativity. I think the last point that I just made about if you want to find happiness, you gotta find a process you can fall in love with. And what better process on falling in love with than not rigor, not just going out and work, 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 work. Like that's that's fine, but you're not you're not living a life if you exclusively work to get the next dollar. Mm -hmm. And likewise, don't go be a starving artist for the sake of being a starving artist. Mm -hmm that Jeff Goins like real artists don't starve. I, be I believe that true and tried and true uh, to my being. That's something I learned very young and was very important in like going out and getting gigs when I was a, you know, a young high schooler mm -hmm. because it was like, yeah, no, you, people will give you money to do this if you get the bodies in the room. So just figure out how to do it. So understanding you're being called to take the seat in between wonder and rigor going out and doing something. And if you can fall in love with that process of what you're gonna do in the effort to make something new in that space between what captures your attention and what you actually know how to do and like to do, then it's not about the money. It's not about the acclaim. It's not about anything else. Mm -hmm. It's you found something that gives you genuine happiness within yourself and ideally is bringing some amount of genuine happiness to a community of other people. And it doesn't matter if that community is one other person. Mm -hmm. You and I would be having this conversation without any camera on it today, mm -hmm. and I would be ecstatic because I very much cherish you as a friend and talking to you about stuff like this. And the idea that this might help one other person, coolest thing in the world to me. And the feeling and I think that's so important. And, and the feeling is mutual. And we've had conversations like this without any camera on, on the phone. Um, but I think that this conversation is going to help more than one. But I agree with you. If one person is all that makes it, worth it. I once read somewhere that we should all have a personal archive. Um, so do you know who said that? And what do they mean by having a personal archive? So this is a really important thing to me. And it's something that I realized. So like you, I've been publishing something daily for way longer than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I've been doing it since 2017 now. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this is part of the love, like fall in love with the process. Uh, I used to do them daily like you. That that process evolved over time just because I started to feel anxiety on getting the thing done, but I didn't want to break the daily streak. And there, there was a cadence. I played around with it a lot over the last couple of years. Then I finally have a new cadence that I really like on the process. But again, the cadence of the process that brings me joy to keep a streak alive that I don't care if anybody looks. So, But this was the original, original, original concept behind Cultish Creative, and I just found the words for it a couple of months ago, and that's a personal archive. What I believe a personal archive is and why I think it's important for anyone compelled to write. If you're not compelled to write, this doesn't have to be for you. If you are compelled to write, I think this is a really thoughtful way to approach it. And it's the idea that we all bump in this stuff all day long. We drink from the fire hose of life and social media and experiences. But I found myself... 2017 and periods earlier when I started to make these notes, like, and can you relate? Like, I felt like I could not have a complete thought because there was just so much information coming at me from all angles all the time. Is that relatable to you? Yeah, I got a notebook where I just jot stuff down because I don't want to forget it. Yeah. And then it's like, well, then how do I go back and look at the notebook or whatever else? And so a personal archive, so cultish creative, I regard as my personal archive. And that's the way where my goal is to have a single complete thought a day. The idea of a personal archive is you have this single complete thought, which is you take in some information and you have to reflect on it. And this was a big unlock for me. You can't just like, like if you just record a quote or if you just 
dial in a journal entry or something, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great habit and practice for people who want to do it. What a personal archive is seeking to do is have a complete thought, which means you must reflect on something you took in. Mm -hmm. So there is a, an emotion, there is a feeling, or there is a behavior in response to some piece of information, content, whatever. When you start to assemble this in complete thought form, what you now have is you have a searchable library, I say in public, but it doesn't have to be published. Mm -hmm. It could be published, meaning like I have it on my blog, on my website. Mm -hmm. You can sign up for a newsletter if you want to see each entry as it goes in. But the idea is like, it's not a book. You can't go to the library and check this out. But I want to make it so that when Matt and Justin have a conversation about an obscure Donny Hathaway song that's following me around in the wild, because you send me a video and I'm like, oh crap, this is this again. Mm -hmm. It just keeps showing up in my life, like eagles show up in your life. Mm -hmm. And I can go, here's my personal archive entry on like the history of this song and that's chasing me around. That works for work, mm -hmm. <laughs> that works in personal relationships, that works with um, me getting my wedding vows together. Like you have now this archive that you can call on of unpublished stuff to stitch together, remember what you wanted, and have complete thoughts at the ready to insert. And I think for people who feel creative but don't know how to be creative yet, or people who are trying to do like what we're doing, trying to do more speaking, trying to do more engaging stuff in different places, the better we are at collecting and completing thoughts around the ideas that move us, the more effective communicators we are. Mm -hmm. The more effective communicators we are, the better we are in front of one person or 10 people or a thousand people or more. And the more we build that muscle and fall in love with that process, the easier it becomes to just start to notice life around us, this soup that we're all swimming in and go like, my antenna's up. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that I'm transmitting. And now I have a method for capturing it so that I can hear stories like, you know, Dan Charnas calling Rick Rubin about House of Pain and him going, yeah, a lot of jumping. <laughs> and that's, that's a beautiful sentiment to me to be able to capture in the archive somewhere about like, hey, even the biggest stars, like they have their misses and we can't forget it. So I'm on a mission to educate people about this thing, what a personal archive is. I'm going to start a whole new thing on the website on cultishcreative.com for like just my notes related to this process. Mm -hmm. But over the last couple of months, I've got a building list of like, how do you start one? What are the things you need to do? And most critically, how to take in information and have a complete thought around it. Because mm -hmm. if there's one thing I see all the time, it's people who have like really interesting facts to share, but they don't have a complete thought. They just have like a random quote or something with no personal attachment. Mm -hmm. And that's never interesting. Mm -hmm. That's what the Daily Notes, they, I mean, I didn't realize that's what they were going to be. But like when they first started, it was, we're getting ready to go to Marco Island for New Year's. So it started last year on our trip to Marco Island. I was meditating every morning on the beach and then I would journal about my meditation, which was not a practice I had beforehand. And for whatever reason, I decided, well, let me type up these journal notes and just like make a blog post. And I posted it and got good feedback. So the process of the daily note has evolved where as much as I would love to say, I meditate every morning before I write. I don't always, sometimes I do, but it's every morning. So anyways, they end up being it's, it's, it is a catalog of my thoughts, whether it is being planted in me or it is my thought and I just think it's being planted in me. And it is kind of cool, but you know, there's so many benefits of this catalog that I'm creating and you're creating and you're encouraging people to create. One, it, it, it allows you to practice and develop the habit and, and find your voice. But also, like as you find your voice and you want to do more creating, you can go back to those thoughts read it again and see what new thoughts you have as you've evolved and learned and take to, taken a new information. And now you have a new catalog entry based off of an old one. So like I think about future talking engagements or speaking engagements or future keep, keep the pursuing series talks. I can just go to my daily notes, pick one that I really liked and then go from there. And then the other thing I think is really, really cool. And this is just because of me being a dad is the legacy play of having this catalog of my thoughts. Like I had a client one time tell me he thought it was so cool I had a podcast because my great, great grandkids were going to be able to hear my voice and hear the crazy things that I once thought. And I was like, I never thought about the legacy play. And not that I'm so important that people need to know who I am generations from now, but I think it would be cool for my great, great, great grandkids to be able to watch me on YouTube in the future and hear what I talked about and see how cool their great, great, great grandfather was. Like, I think that's really cool. So 
you know, who knows what your thoughts today may mean in the future. Like, was Marcus Aurelius aware that we were all going to be quoting, you know, meditations and other books generations later? No, he was writing and journaling and like kept them. Who knows what your thoughts may mean in the future? It, you know, we, you may be a Basquiat in the future of your written word that in the moment people weren't really paying that much attention to it. But later on, your wisdom was helping people and became relevant. And that is your, your legacy gift to the world is this personal catalog that you originally created for yourself that somehow found value for other people. So I think it's a really cool idea. And I'm glad that you're creating steps and ways for, to help people do it. Because I think a lot of people will never do it because they're not creative and they won't figure out a way to do it. Like we need to show people and tell people, here's how you do it. It's really, really easy. And then as they do it, they'll begin to build their own tweaks to it. And, you know, maybe they'll start out in a Google doc and they'll create a, a notion dashboard and that becomes their catalog, like tons of ways to execute it. But having someone like you to give the beginning steps, it will get a lot of people to start moving down this path. And you don't have to, like you don't have to write the book or I, the thing that really has surprised me the most with people reaching out to me since I started sharing this stuff is like the people who are like, I don't want to do social media. I don't want to share this on LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, but I want to like do this. And it might be because like the world I used to live in where a compliance department said no, mm -hmm. or it might just because somebody's like, I don't, like I'm not after that audience. I'm not after being that thought leader. I had a very thoughtful conversation earlier this week with somebody who's like, I've, they've done a series of very, very high profile things, but they were just like, I'm not introduced. I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. And they want to do like some local radio and like other, like really kind of weird, uh, weird, like unique, weird, like niche stuff. And I'm like, how freaking lucky is that community? They get to hear this. Mm -hmm. uh, Walt Whitman first edition. Are, are you familiar with leaves of grass? Are you familiar with the book I in concept it. at least? I haven't read it now, but I mean, I know who Walt Whitman is and yeah, totally fine if you haven't read it, but this is like, this became part of the template for this whole idea. Mm -hmm. So Walt Whitman first publishes leaves of grass in 1855 and it has 12 poems in it. Mm -hmm. And this is really important too, because this is a published book of poetry, mm -hmm. but Walt Whitman doesn't just leave the first edition when he dies. And they call it the deathbed version in 1892. I have a copy of it back there on my shelf. 400 poems. Oh, wow. There's 400 entries in the book. It's the same book. It's the same title. But with his entire you know life, 1855 to 1892, 12 entries to 400 entries, ent entries re-edited, recycled, some poems totally changed and evolved over that time, multiple times in multiple iterations. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be Walt Whitman, but you can do this too. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is just trying to write down stuff that got your got your wonder up enough mm -hmm. that you could take the rigorous activity of like jotting it down and completing a thought around it. And this is what makes your your daily notes are at their best. My favorite ones are when you have the quote, you have the the inspiration, the muse has delivered something to you, mm -hmm. and then you pause and you give like like the notes to the, the kids on their birthdays mm -hmm. or just the stuff about life or whatever. And you don't even, if you don't want to disclose personal details, don't disclose personal details. Mm -hmm. But you share an emotion, you fair, share a feeling, you share a behavior that was triggered by this thing and what you're going to go and do with it. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it creates for the reader, for me, opening your email every morning, here's Justin before the quote, the insight, whatever. Mm -hmm. Here's Justin receiving this and wrestling with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then here's where Justin is afterwards, mm -hmm. either in a changed emotional state with a changed opinion on something that's there, or I'm going to go out into the world and do this thing. That's that cool. example for your kids, that's your leaves of grass right there. Mm -hmm. And that's that, hey, your family's a community too. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget. That's, that's cool to hear how like, you process the notes. Cause I play around with like the types of notes. Some mm -hmm. days I do just put a quote and I do that intentionally, not cause I'm being lazy because I just like, I don't want to give you any thoughts. I want you to read this quote and you to think about what it means to you. And then maybe later on I'll come back and tell you. Um, so it's kind of cool to hear how you process. And I never thought about it from a standpoint of here's me processing. And here's me at the end after I've gotten that quote. Cause you know, we're never the same person twice. Like I've never thought about it that way. Uh, I so it's cool though, but I can read your notes and I can see you going through that. This is the cool part about you making this a daily activity right now, because I can actually see 
how you had to wrestle with that thing and what the before and after. And that's what closes the loop. Mm -hmm. If all you do is do the journal entry or share the thing or just purge something, there's no loop to be closed. Mm -hmm. But when there's that little kernel of content or inspiration, now you wrap a before and after mm -hmm. around it. I want, I want to go back before we wrap up to your comment about having like not publishing. And mm -hmm. I understand people may not want to put their thoughts out there for, you know, fear of judgment or whatever it might be. But I would pull from, from Ruben and say that gating that could potentially be selfish to the rest of us. Like, who, who are you to say that the thoughts that you have aren't important to other people out there? So, um, I mean, depending on what you're, you're writing about, but I would encourage people to share it and maybe you don't have to like blast it on social media and make a big deal about it. But that way, if I'm supposed to read and learn from your thoughts, that thought, that, that piece of creation is going to find its way to me because the universe is going to bring me to it. But if it's on your laptop and it's not in a public domain, I may never benefit from this great thought that you have that you're diminishing for a variety of reasons. So I would challenge people that when they, when they create their personal catalog to create a version, whether it is maybe you leave out the personal side or you leave out some things, but just to put it out there and just let it be, put it out in the universe and let it be what it's supposed to be and let it benefit people. And, and like, don't even check the analytics on it. Just let it be there so we can learn because we all have great ideas in our head. We all have things. We all have different perspectives, different experiences that allow us to, to have a unique perspective that we can all learn from. So if you keep it to yourself, that's great and better than not doing it. But I would argue you might be cheating the world out of some great work. And maybe you are Walt Whitman, but because you never shared it, you never got to be that. The... The push to put it somewhere in public, even if you don't promote it in public, I think is actually really important. Mm -hmm. And that's with the personal archive of saying it's not a library, it's not a book you have to publish, and you don't have to go on a book tour mm -hmm. for every post you wrote. Mm -hmm. But what I do want is I want to know you made a public record. I want you to know you made a public record that, again, even if you're not promoting, is shareable, if not discoverable by others. Mm -hmm. Because the magic of this and this is this was part of like the inspiration for the original idea of putting it, you know, putting it on the internet at the very beginning. Um, and when I was putting it on the internet at the very beginning, I kept thinking about. So this is like 2017 when I like registered a domain and started putting stuff up for the first time. And it wasn't even Cultish Creative at first, um, because before that it was several years of doing a version of this just in the notes on my phone. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that for a couple of years before I realized I could do this. And then that turned, you know, it, these things evolve. So the act of putting it in public, and so you read Farnham Street, you're mm -hmm. familiar with Shane Parrish and yep. his stuff, right? Yeah. Do you, um, do you remember, and I'm, I'm never going to get what it was, but do you remember the original Farnham Street site? Were you ever on it before it was called Farnham Street? Do you remember what it was? Not beforehand, no. Okay, so like. I don't remember who put me onto this or whatever. I came into the financial services industry and financial advising. So like I'm in like that 2006, seven period. I start in the, on the consumer banking and commercial banking side of the business, then migrate over right before the crisis. Cause you know, I have impeccable market timing in my job selection, clearly. So, uh, you know, I go into the recording industry right when recording studios are all dying. And then I go into financial services and banking right at the uh, peak of the, great financial crisis. Um, so in trying to figure out like what the hell just happened in the world and learning about like, you know, value investing and all this other stuff in the wake of the crisis, somebody put me onto this website that was just talking about like Warren Buffett stuff because I had this growing interest in Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. And I remember like I used to have to have it, I had it written down on my desk because it was like, it was the zip code for Berkshire Hathaway's office or something. Like the original Farnham Street was deliberately unfindable. Huh. And when I started my first site, I was like, okay, let's just make it deliberately unfindable. I don't want compliance to ever sniff this out that I'm trying to do this thing. And I don't even necessarily want like friends or family to know I'm doing this thing, but I want to do it. And what was crazy was like even doing that on an anonymous WordPress site, like people started to like just magically show up mm -hmm. and subscribe. And that was a huge part of the confidence lift to be like, okay. Maybe instead of just anonymously sharing this on the internet, I can talk to other humans in real life about it. Mm -hmm. And that was a big coming out of the shell process. And I mean, indirectly, I can definitely trace that back to the early iterations of Farnham Street was saying like, look, this is how you do it. 
Maybe, Maybe you don't want to show anybody or promote it, but you can still put it in public. Mm -hmm. And that's so important. Performance, again, back to the five Ps. I agree. All right, any, any closing thoughts to, to wrap this awesome conversation up? I'm going to take it all the way back to authentic creativity and just say you have to be the person, the self, the principal in charge of making the thing. Mm -hmm. You make the thing by taking your seat in between wonder and rigor. And if you ever are lost on wonder, try to add some rigor. If you're ever lost on rigor, try to find your curiosity. Try to add some wonder back into the equation. And it's only tragic if you don't build the bridge. But if you sit there in the middle and you try to communicate by building the bridge and making that novel thing that you can even share with one other person, man, you get in the habit of doing that and just the doors and the relationships and the things in your life that start to open, better than money. It's better than money. And you meet friends like, uh, like my buddy Justin Costelli here <laughs> because you're just out there putting yourself out there and having a good time. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I'm looking forward to many, many more years of phone calls, text messages, exchanges in the emails, um, and, and me doing deeper dives into researching things to not be embarrassed on my own show when you ask me if I know all this stuff. I don't. <laughs> so you're going to force me to become better. So I love it. Um, where can they find Cultish Creative? Where can they follow you? And make sure we plug your stuff and get that in the show notes. So Cultish Creative, uh, cultishcreative.com. Find me on Twitter or X or whatever, at Cultish Creative. Find me on LinkedIn, uh, Matt Ziegler. My firm, Registered Investment Advisor, Sunpoint Investments, we do all sorts of stuff, a lot of stuff with like founders, family offices, business owners, stuff like that. Really cool small RIA, really cool business. And hey, my job is I get to talk to people mm -hmm. about creativity and strategy and putting their stuff. And then I have this amazing team of planners and investment professionals who do all the really hard work behind me. Um, but the biggest reason we're here today is Cultish Creative. I want to help people build personal archives. And if you're trying to do something or put your writing out into the world and find community, get in touch. Let me help you find your people. And don't go thinking you have to know who it is first. Mm -hmm. Play. Who comes to you? Give it time. All right. So I want to end with, I'm stealing this from the All the Smoke podcast. I don't know if you listen to that at all. So shout out no. to Steven Jackson and Matt Barnes. So they end the show and I want to do this. Who is one guest you'd like to see on the Life Design Plus podcast with the caveat being you have to help get them on the show? So if you say Rick Rubin, you got to help me get Rick Rubin on the show. <laughs> Which, you know, <laughs> I'd love to do. Uh, man, who could we get? on your show all right you're definitely putting me on the spot with this so i want to i want to like shoot down a little bit and say dan charnas might be a hard grab that could be a fun one for us to try to chase down um or uh you know who else might be really fun hey actually you know what I, i'm gonna give uh, can i give like a stretch goal yeah. and like a reasonable goal yeah, yeah okay so like give me the dr dre goal and then give me the josh brown goal all right so I think the Dr. Dre role, just because I feel like you probably don't know who he is, and I feel like it would just be a fun conversation. Do you know who Dante Ross is? I can't say that I do. One of my favorite music A&Rs ever. He's touched more of your life. He, I'm pretty sure he, he landed, I can't remember if he landed or he passed on House of Pain. He did the Everlast thing. Mm -hmm. But he was like there with the Beastie Boys in New York City and going to Bad Brain shows with them when they were punk kids all the way through. Okay. Like he's been... If Rick Rubin's touched all aspects of your life, like Dante Ross has A and R'd more aspects of your life mm -hmm. than you even know. Okay. So he's he's my stretch goal. All right. My less of a stretch goal because it's like a mutual friend, but on the creative process, and especially because of the music side, is just so friggin' cool. You got to get Niall Bear on here. Yeah, he's already on my wish list, so we'll we'll get Niall on for sure. You got to um, get that guy talking. Mm -hmm. oh, and the you funny get thing him is, in the public more. Funny funny thing you say that I was thinking, man, me. And Matt and Niall, and then my friend Michael Polakar, and then you oh, know Jeff Chapman. Cha Jeff Chapman's an advisor up in Canada. That dude knows a lot about hip hop as well. Like the all of us sitting down around like this would be where I'd be cool to be able to do like the LeBron uh, barbershop conversation. Like when I have a budget one day, <laughs> fly us all in. Let's go to a barbershop or somewhere cool, and then just sit and talk around hip-hop and stuff like that so well, music not, in our career the barbershop yep. round table yep yep but not awesome. niall will I, be I on the show that. when the time is right so so that is a good pick all right so um i want to thank you for giving me so much of your time um you know, this was an awesome conversation i knew it was going to be good even before our, our email exchanges this morning because 
I knew this morning we were going to be on the same page just off of the, the exchange. So I appreciate you coming on the show. More importantly, I appreciate your friendship and the back and forth and the support that you give me and the encouragement you give me to keep on pursuing and keep this thing going. Man, what an episode. I just love the five P's, those pillars that Matt talked about. Do me a favor, jump down to the comments while you're there, hit subscribe, turn your notifications on so you don't miss all the episodes coming, but let Matt know what he shared that really resonated with you or share something creative that you're working on to put that out in the universe, draw some attention to it or put some momentum behind it. But just let Matt know how much you appreciated the episode. I would really appreciate it and I think he will as well. You know, I think that Matt really set the bar high for what these expert episodes are going to look like in the coming year and beyond as the podcast continues to grow. And I'm really excited about having subject matter experts come in to complement the episodes of people who have gone on their pursuit and found their authentic life. So thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're listening on the podcast players, I would welcome a review, any feedback, any comments to help this podcast find its way to more people. Because I think stories like the ones we're going to be hearing from our guests, subject matter experts like Matt are really going to help people out there find, pursue, and get to live their authentic life. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining me on my pursuit. It's an honor to be a part of yours and let's keep pursuing.